Hey there, Salt Strong Nation, Joe Simons, like diamonds. We just filmed another awesome podcast episode, and this is another one we brought back the cameras, so we filmed the whole thing, and we have it all here for you. It's everything that you need to know about finding really good spots to catch more redfish and more snook and more trout while wade fishing. We got a guy who's been wade fishing now for 40 plus years, and he has a wealth of knowledge. You're really going to love this one, and this is really good for you, even if you don't traditionally fish from shore, even if you're usually fishing in a boat or cock or powder board, a lot of great reasons to get out, put your wading boots on, and get in the water. Pow! Hello there, Salt Strong Nation. We're back. Another Fish Strong episode. This is Joe Simons. And Luke Simons. Oh, Luke, are you there? You never I'm know. There. The last, oh. la- last, last couple, we've had some issues here, so I, always, so I have I'm to on ask. my phone. The phone has been good luck, so I'm sticking with it. I'm riding this right on the old iPhone, trusty oh, iPhone. Oh, Skype on the phone. Well, this is going to be a really cool episode. This is actually one of our fellow Insider Fishing Club members, call him Waiter Dave, that we're going to hear from here in just a second. The guy's been wade fishing for, I believe, like 40 years all over the place. And he's kind of got this thing down to a science now. And he was just telling us a funny story. He's actually at a causeway right now where he just caught a few trout in about 40 minutes and, and all the guys next to him are getting uh, getting skunked. And just going to reveal some of the things that he has learned over those handful of, uh, I guess, four uh, decades, uh, some of the mistakes he's made, and, and really just how to hone in on catching more redfish, more snook, more trout, more flounder, why wade fishing. But first... This episode, like all the episodes, are, is sponsored by the Salt Strong Insider Fishing Club. It is the only club out there that actually reveals spots and reveals trends every single week, all year long. And here's the deal. If you're listening to this right now and you're into weight fishing and you're into catching these inshore fish, I want you to join. And if you don't catch more fish over the next year, I will personally pay for your membership. That's right. I have literally taken all the risk off of you and I will literally pay for your membership. So go to 100% Salt, guarantee. 100% guarantee. Go to saltstrong.com forward slash podcast to learn more about the Insider Fishing Club. So that's it. We've now heard from our sponsors. Now we're going to talk <laughs> to Waiter Dave. Waiter Dave, you there? I'm here. And to preface, Waiter Dave, I'm also calling you that because I can't pronounce your last name. Tell us your last name for everyone else who wants to look you up well, and look up. Just, just, you know, that, that's the same reason that a lot of people call me Waiter Dave. <laughs> uh, even folks that know me for 40 years can't pronounce my last name. So the last name is Huguenot, but uh, but Dave or Waiter Dave is much easier. So uh, I, I don't I don't take offense to that. Believe me, uh, Waiter Dave it is. Waiter Dave it is. <laughs> At least for this episode. So okay. y- you reached out to me, and I knew your name just from the community, but I did not know how much extensive time and knowledge you had out waiting flats and causeways and all kinds of places. So let's talk about you know your history. Like take us back thirty or forty years. Like how did you get into to weight fishing, and then kind of tie into where we are now, and then we'll talk about a bunch of tactics. Yeah, well, I guess uh, just quickly, I grew, I grew up in Michigan, which uh, if, if you haven't been there or never lived there, you probably don't know, but it's a fish-crazy state, obviously lots of water, and so grew up fishing and freshwater fishing, so so literally have been a fishing addict uh, since I probably was about six or seven years old, but I, uh, I moved to Florida in 1980 uh, after uh, finishing college at the University of Michigan, and so uh, obviously wanted to continue with my uh, passion for fishing down here, but I didn't have a boat. I was broke. And, uh, you know, so I had to look for, you know, inexpensive opportunities to try to catch fish. So probably a, a natural progression for a lot of people that, that moved to Florida. I started first going to, to fishing piers along uh, some of the beaches in, in, uh, in Pinellas County, in particular Reddington uh, Reddington beach, uh, and the Reddington fishing pier there. And so started there and, you know, probably like a lot of people, uh, you know, went and bought a, uh, 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 a rig from, uh, from the tackle shop there that included a, a one ounce lead weight, uh, threaded on a, about a foot and a half section of, uh, steel leader and a, and a red bead on either side and a swivel. And so oh, tied yeah. that on, I knew you were going to say swivel. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. But bought, bought their uh, you know 
two dollars worth of frozen shrimp, went to the very end of the pier, put it on there, threw it out, and sat and waited, right? And uh, and for the most part, waited and waited and waited. Um, but uh, but over time, uh, you know, like like most people, I was watching the guys that were catching fish, trying to see what they were using for bait and and how they were rigged, and so slowly but surely, kind of figured out how to catch, you know fish from from the pier but for the most part it was whiting because i continued to use you know frozen bait and all the rest whiting maybe an occasional flounder occasionally in a trout if i caught a trout i thought i was on fire and, and even a an occasional black drum or a redfish but for the most part it was whiting and and uh, and stuff along that line but so I, I progressed from there to to bridges uh you know i you know went, went the whole route of fish you know john's pass i'd fish all the time uh those kinds of places but those were tough uh, tough places to fish, and if you happen to catch something decent, and you know, you had to figure out how to bring it up onto the bridge, and uh, I'd never heard of a gaff net at that point in time, and so different things. So, and then from there, started you know working some of the seawalls along some of the so some of the local causeways, and went out to Passagrill Beach, uh, fished along there on the intercoastal, and, and so again all all areas that didn't require a boat because I couldn't afford one, um, didn't require an entry fee because I couldn't afford to pay it. And uh, it was, you know, using really, for the most part, freshwater tackle, you know, light tackle, and uh, and and really, uh, for the most part, either dead or maybe after payday, I'd, I'd had enough money to go buy some live shrimp, but uh, but that was kind of it. And um, and so, you know, I, I tell you, you know, really, the first ten to twenty years of my fishing and, and wade fishing experience down here was not really very productive. Uh, and there weren't a lot of people that were writing about it. There certainly weren't any, there certainly wasn't, was no internet. So there was no access to, to sites like salt strong, which, uh, you know, today can, can teach you in, in a week what it took me 10 or 15 years to learn. Uh, but, but literally I spent 10 or 20 years just kind of knocking around and trying to figure things out on my own. And I got better slowly, but surely I figured out places to go. Uh, but you know, I, I, the, the epiphany for me really came when I, I decided that I didn't want to have to pay for bait. I, I developed a bad back, didn't want to throw a cast net. And so started using artificials and, uh, and, and went out. And in fact, my really the first artificial I remember using down here, I don't know if you guys remember a lure called Love's Lure. Oh yeah. A, uh, oh, yeah. Basically a, a tandem uh, lead head jig with a, with a white or pink, you know, kind of a straight plastic tail on it uh that was rigged uh with i'm these days i'm guessing it was probably 40 or 50 pound mono uh <laughs> and, and again tied to a, a barrel swivel right but the fact is that that thing worked and so it caught a bunch of I fish started right, using we... that. yeah and i but i so i didn't have to go out and catch my bait or go buy it i it eliminated the time i needed to do that so you know i'd go to my spots i'd start throwing that jig out and and again i i started catching fish and more importantly it wasn't just the usual you know bottom feeders that i were getting using the the the, the dead shrimp or whatever but i started catching some trout catch the occasional redfish i remember the first time i caught a snook i mean i was like i, I couldn't believe it i was so excited I, I thought that that was the most elusive fish in the world um but uh but again slowly but surely. so the first you know 10 15 years it was a slow progress Got into artificials, and then things kind of started, uh, you know, I started, I guess, uh, evolving, uh, you know, exponentially at that point. And, and you know, listen, I, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but even I started to notice over a period of 10 or 15 years that there were certain characteristics of the water or the areas that I fished that were more productive than others, right? And so started putting that together. And so, you know, you start figuring out where to go. That's, you know, probably the, the first and the most important thing and and second then is really you know trying to figure out what baits to use uh or artificial lures to use uh and then 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 you kind of start getting into the refinement right of you know what's the best retrieve for the lures what's the the best color you know start noticing the difference from season to season and some spots are better in one season than the other but start putting it that all together and you know it just kind of dawned on me you know 20 years later uh and all of a sudden i started catching a lot of fish and more fish than the people that that were fishing next to me uh my friends uh you know were, were starting to you know they, they'd always know i was obsessed and i always waited so I, i've been called waiter dave for a long time but uh they started saying waiter dave with more with uh, admiration than than uh and you know i think uh as a uh you know 
thinking I was kind of an idiot for all the time I spent <laughs> in the water and how little I thought. But uh, but anyway, so um, so again, I, so really the last ten. 15 years i've as i said I've, I've continued to refine but uh for the most part you know what i learned over those first 15 years still applies and again it's really identifying where to go what to use how to use it um and in the same regard you know I, as i mentioned to you i'm sitting out of the dunedin causeway today i've been fishing this dunedin causeway uh literally for since 1980 it's one of the first places i ever fished and you know, I, I'm probably out here a hundred days a year, if not more. And every time I go out, I still learn a little something and I continue to, you know, I work different locations and different times of the year. And, um, is, is, I, and I know it like the back of my hand, but I still continue to learn things. I still, I still get a little bit better every year. Uh, and, and to the point where, you know, I, I am what I would consider to be, you know, truly an expert around the Dunedin Causeway, but, you know, it's a, listen, it, it's a two and a half mile stretch, but it's five miles of fishable water with all kinds of different structure. You got two bridges, you got inlets coming and going. And so there's all kinds of different, I don't know what the right word, you know, micro, uh, micro cosms, right. Within this one causeway that, that are the same kinds of things that you're going to face if you wade or fish just about anywhere, right. You got stretches of, of beach and grass flats. You got some, drop-offs and channels you got uh you know as i said bridges and the structure that, that comes along with that uh but but you know it's a great way to learn how to fish and how to dissect an area um but it also proves that no matter how much you think you know you know the we, we all know the water has changed sandbars come and go grass flats you know get bigger and smaller um and listen quite honestly just just the amount that you know, the fishing is no doubt in my mind through conservation gotten better over the last 20 years as well. I mean, I catch snook not only because I'm a better fisherman, but there's just a lot more of them here than there were 25 years ago and redfish the same thing. I mean, back, I remember in the nineties, you know, you were lucky to, to get reds around here, but, uh, you know, they're, they're all over the place now. And, and, you know, the trout continue to be very strong, but, uh, but anyway, so that, that was a long answer about how I got started. Um, <laughs> but you know, as I said, it, it's, it's really been a progression and, uh, I warned you that once I get started, I'm, I'm tough to, to, to get stopped uh, when it comes to <laughs> talking about fishing uh, this in is, particular. This is great. Yeah. And you were, you were humble. You didn't mention you've created this whole, you know, waders guide and you actually take people out on, on trips, on wade fishing trips. And, and then finally, I want to get this myth out of there. Wade fishing is not the poor man's fishing. You mentioned earlier, that's why you got into it. But today, I know a little bit more about your backstory after getting to know you as an insider member and talking. You, know, you have your own company. You've made decent money. You own a boat and a kayak and a paddleboard, I think, and yet this is still your preferred method of fishing, right? It is. In fact, you know, I didn't I, – so I, I moved here in 80. I didn't get my first boat until probably 1991 or so, uh, and I thought it was going to open up the world to me, right? God, I mean, listen, you know, I, I never had a boat, and I, you know, I have to admit, I love to wade fish, but I was always envious a little bit of the guy that was out there in the boat. And this, at that point in time, too, you know, nobody used kayaks. I'd never even heard of a paddleboard. And so, you know, there really wasn't, you know, these inexpensive opportunities to get yourself off of the shoreline, right? Um, so you really had to have a boat. But I got my first boat. I thought it was going to open up all these new opportunities to fish and these, you know, new experiences. I was going to go offshore. And so I got it. I, you know, I went offshore about two or three times. And, you know, it took me an hour and a half, two hours to get to fishable waters. I was using heavy equipment, having to rig up. And literally, you know, two hours before I'm fishing, and I'm thinking to myself, geez, if I was wading, I'd have been probably out fishing and back in already, right? And, <laughs> and likely have caught fish. So just from a time perspective, boating is, is you know, a whole different story. And not to mention the expense and all this, but, but the reality is it, it, after about, you know, a year of kind of, testing it and trying it and forcing myself into it i was really the only reason i take the boat out was to get me to a spot where i could get out and wait and um and so i listen i've had a boat you know continuously since then and, and again i i use it literally uh with, with only rare exception to only get me to places where i can hop out and wait same thing with my kayak i you know i love my kayak but all i use the kayak for is to get me someplace that i can get out and wade um in fact a lot of times i throw my kayak in my boat 
I take the boat to a uh, to a kind of an isolated in, in where I am. I'm in North Pinellas, so you know Honeymoon Island, Caladesi Island, and Clode Island, all those areas, and it's typically on the inside. So I'll take the boat. I'll anchor up right you know as close to the mangrove shoreline as I can. I throw the kayak out, and I don't get in the kayak. All I do is I tie it to me, and then I start wading along the shoreline. And I, the only reason I have the kayak is, you know, I will I do run into the occasional shark, and so once in a while I'll I'll just say maybe I should jump in the uh, the kayak just just to uh, avoid a confrontation. Protection. But, but more often than not, it, yeah, it, it, all all it is it, it's a way to get me back to the boat. Um, without having to, to fish the water that I just did on the way out. So I, I really can feel like I can fish twice as far as I did if I didn't have it. So that's really the only reason I use it. Cool. Um, but uh, and, and the same thing for the paddleboard. I thought, hey, there's another opportunity. The same thing. I just use it to get me, you know, out to where I can get out and wade. But, uh, listen, I, you know, it's not for everybody, and, and, and I get that. But uh, it, it's definitely my preferred method of fishing. And I will, I'll you know, I'll put – wade fishing up against any other method of fishing uh when it comes to productivity and not just numbers of fish but for size of fish and again obviously in inshore inshore species but for trout you know every one of my you know, my biggest trout my biggest snook my biggest redfish have all come from wading and um and and i would say it's the same for just about every one of my friends that wades with me but that you know but that also are, are you know as avid about fishing from their boats as they are uh, for, for waiting. So, um, you know, that, that's, you know, that's kind of my premise for it. No. And it's, yeah, it's, it's something that everyone should know how to do, regardless if you're going to go wade the current spots that you're at, or if you are fishing near causeways or bridges, passes, et cetera. But even if you're on vacation, like we were talking about that this morning, Luke, you're on vacation or, or even if you're just in a different city, like we were in Sebastian last week, we had an extra time, like get an hour to kill man what a great way to just go out there and, and, and wade you know off off one of the causeways or wherever we might be so uh, i i think it's something that everyone should uh, know how to do so you mentioned it earlier the most critical part of wade fishing is knowing how to find like a productive spot because it's not like you aren't a boat where you can just get up and go an extra mile so let's talk about how do you find you know the most ideal spot like what are you looking for both maybe pre-planning like you know google maps and then what you're looking for when you're actually on the water or on yeah, the, so, on the foot. You know, well, like, like you said, if I'm going to, if I'm going to visit an area, you know, inevitably I'd pull the iPad out, go to Google maps and, and I start, you know, scouting out the area because first on my mind is, you know, if I'm going for business or even if I'm going with my wife or, you know, if I, really the first thing on my mind is where am I going to fish when I get there? Um, and so, you know, I go to Google maps. And so what, what I love to look for, and I, you know, I, I causeways are are and can be awesome spots to fish and so you know there, there's especially down on coastal florida right actually you know anywhere in the southeast along the coast you know typically you've got you know barrier islands and so you've got these causeways or roads that connect the mainland with the barrier islands right and so typically you've got along those causeways um, at least on one side of the causeway you've got typically a strip of kind of firm sand uh, that, you know, normally comes in with typically a strip of, of, of grass. And then beyond that, normally there's a channel. And the channel was actually created because that's where the fill for the causeway came from, right? So you've got kind of almost this, you know, this built-in structure there. You've got, you know, you've got a line between, first of all, the beach and, and the water. You've got another line between the sand and the grass. Uh, and then you got another line between the grass and the channel. And, you know, I think, you know, as, as you guys know, and as most of the contributors at Salt Strong will tell you, is that, you know, all those, all those demarcations are great, great opportunities to find fish, right? The fish love to cruise the edges of, of, of grass and sand, uh, or you look for potholes within the grass flat, or the fish that, you know, on colder days or when it gets really hot, they like to mosey into the deeper water. Uh, to either get warmer or colder, and they tend to hang towards that edge of, of, of the channel and the grass. But So causeways create that opportunity. Along those causeways, you're also going to find areas where there may be, you know, rubble that was dumped, could be rocks, riprap. Uh, you know, there could be, you know, there's still areas where there's some downed trees or even mangroves. 
and again, those are all great areas. You know, fish look for any any anything like that uh, because it tends to attract bait. If there happen to be oyster bars uh, or beds along there, those are great areas. Um, you know, a lot of the causeways. In fact, uh, you know, Courtney Campbell Causeway, uh, which connects Tampa and, and Clearwater, uh, is is a great causeway. You know, almost the entire Pinellas section of that causeway. Uh, and again, it's tough to access in some cases, but th- there's rock all along the edge of the seawall and the causeway there. And on some of the higher tides, those, you know, redfish get up in there, snook get up in there, depending on the time of your trout. And, and you just walk parallel to that, uh, to that area between the rocks and the sand, and you'll be amazed at the bait fish you see and all the rest. So, so there's all kinds of structure there. Um, and a lot of the causeways have that. And, you know, again, as I mentioned, so Dunedin Causeway, is, listen, it's only a two-and-a-half-mile stretch of of causeway, but virtually every foot of it is fishable. And you got two sides. So you literally have five miles of fishable water. And granted, some areas are better than others, and, and you know, uh, depending upon the time of year and, and, quite honestly, even from year to year, you, you've also got two bridges, right? And so – depending on whether the tide's coming or going, these are natural points for, for fish to congregate where you've got, you know, the, the current coming through and the channel and, and, and washing in or out on a, on a flat that's adjacent or a sandbar. Um, but, so again, what I tell you is the same kinds of things that you talk about on Salt Strong uh, that, that hold fish when you're fishing from the boat apply to when you're waiting, right? And I also just, you know, when I say waiting, you can fish a causeway in most cases without ever getting in the water, or getting your feet wet. You can fish along a seawall. You can fish along the beach edge and you don't have to cast a mile. Um, in fact, you know, one of the classic mistakes, at least in my mind, I see with people wade fishing or fishing for the beaches, they want to wade out as far as they can and then start casting. Right. And, and of course, casting straight out, and I laugh because I'm thinking, you know, probably 90% of the fish that are on this beach or causeway are between the beach and where that guy is standing, not not from where he's standing and out. Yeah. Uh, because they're they're for the most part uh, on that you know that grass edge um, or along the structure, and and if they were casting parallel, they might have a chance at it rather than straight out. But um, you know, that, those are the kinds of things. So th- so there's all kinds of opportunities in, in fishable water. Um, and listen, some are better than others. You know, I, I will tell you, those causeways that have, you know, more grass areas are better. Uh, the causeways that have more structure are better than those that don't have structure. Um, and and so, you know, the, again, having a channel run the entire length of a causeway can, can be a great thing to have as well. Um, as I said, it just provides deeper water and, and access for the fish to come and go, depending upon the weather. Um, the other great thing about a causeway is that it doesn't matter which direction the wind's coming. There's almost all, you can almost always, one side or the other is going to be fishable. Um, you know, the, the, the Dunedin Causeway runs for the most part east-west. Um, you know, an east or a west wind makes it a little bit more difficult, but typically, you know, you can still fish it. If, if you have a north wind, you fish from the south side. If, you have, if it's a south wind, you fish from the north side. It's, it's just, so, there's, so you can fish it under any circumstances. Um, but, but again, so causeways are, are probably what my, you know, number one target. Um, and then second for me are, are beaches. Um, you know, the, the, the amount of fish that, that run along the beaches anywhere in Florida for that matter. And I, you know, I literally have fished the beaches from the panhandle all the way around, you know, the West coast and up the East coast, um, are, are amazing what, what kind of fish they hold. And, uh, and again, are easy to fish. Uh, and, you know, surprisingly, it's some of the busiest beaches, you know, during the day that, that tend to hold the most fish. If, and if you can fish them early in the morning, you can fish them later in the evening when there aren't as many people out there, or even better sometimes when the weather conditions aren't great, um, they don't get fished a lot because there's too many people there. They don't get a lot of fishing pressure. Uh, but, you know, depending on the time of the year, there, there's, you know, anything from, you know, monster snook roaming the beaches you know, redfish, trout, again, you'll find in the summertime, mackerel, jacks, anything and everything. But but beaches are another one of my favorites. And, uh, you know, you can also bring your wife and your family along. They, they're happy and content 
sitting out on the beach all day long while I'm fishing all day long. And so, you know, everybody leaves happy. That, that, that makes a big difference. It's not like I'm, uh, you know, uh, you know, heading out in the boat all day long and I'll, you know, and, and don't see them all weekend. Right. So, um, so that's a, another big advantage, at least in my mind of, of wade fishing is just the ability to bring, bring the family along. And, uh, you know, that, that just, uh, yeah, makes, makes everybody happy. Right. Yeah. It's a win, win, win all around. So, yeah. In my experience with beach fishing, you mentioned it like on the causeway, a mistake you see a lot of people making is, you know, wading, you know, up to their nipples to get out there real deep and all the fish are behind them. I find the same on on the beach. A lot of the beaches that we fish, I mean, some of those really big snook are in like a few inches of water. Like, and if you're in the water, you ain't going to catch them. So it's another one where you don't even have to get wet in a lot of times, right? No, absolutely. And, and although, you know, it's interesting, I, I've done it both ways, but my preference when I'm fishing the beach, I actually like to get in the water, you know, maybe, and maybe only knee deep. Um, and especially, again, I, I love to look for beaches that have a, 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 you know, kind of a deep swash, uh, so that, you know, you've got bait and the larger fish can run up and down that swash, um, on, on, you know, on, on depending upon the tide phase. But I, I get in and actually will wade, um, and cast, for the most part, I'm just casting parallel, literally from the shoreline, and to, you know maybe, you know if you're looking at the clock, if I'm if I'm working my way down the swash, um, I'll, I'll fish from the from the again where the beach meets the water to maybe you know two o'clock, three o'clock, rarely, but it's it's that's where those you're right. Those fish are in anywhere from six inches to you know to a few feet of water, but um, as I said, I like to actually get in there. I get a little lower profile because I, I am convinced that if I can see the fish more often than not, they can see me. So I may end up blind casting to some extent, but if I know the fish are there, I, I don't mind so much because they're not, they're not seeing me. I've got a lower profile, um, and they're less likely to see me. And so I can catch fish that might be a little bit closer, but, uh, but listen, I, often I'm, I'm literally, you know, I may, and again, you're, you're also very quiet, right? I can't tell you how often I'm literally waiting amongst a school of, of snook or trout or whatever it is. And we'll literally just have to, you know, drop my lure four or five feet in front of me and watch the, the, the fish hit it and, you know, watch it go crazy. But I mean, that's, that's the, that's, you know, the advantage of, of waiting, but, but yeah, I absolutely agree that it, it's most of the fish and the big fish I've catch from the beach are, are probably no more than, you know, 10 feet uh, you know, from the shoreline and, and more often than not, you know, in, in some sort of a swash or some sort of a, uh, washout, right. That, that, you know, allows the, the tide to come in and out of those swashes out into the, to the, you know, the, the main, uh, the main Gulf there. So those are the kinds of areas I love. And I love to find, I love to fish the areas around inlets. Um, you know, right now, in fact, I'm sitting here looking at the uh, South end of honeymoon Island and, uh, you know, that beach, that comes down there and wraps around into the inlet. Those are awesome areas for, for fishing and, and especially for snook in the summertime, but they hold trout all year round. They hold big reds, they hold drum, they hold, you know, anything and everything. But, uh, but those are all fishable just from, from the beach. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just amazing what you catch there. Yeah, and I, I like the, the fact you mentioned earlier that you're, your big, your aha moment, your change, you know, where you, you had your, your success, where you, we started to see the most improvement is when you switch from live bait to artificial. And cause I, cause that the same exact thing happened with me. And I think, I think a reason for that is because when you're doing artificial, it really forces you to pay attention to, you know, the type of structure you're fishing with live bait. It's just really easy to cast it and, and just kind of let it sit. Um, whereas live bait, you know, it kind of forces you to eventually pay attention to those lines. As you mentioned on the causeway, you have, you know, up, you know, up near the shoreline, then you have the sand before the, 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 uh, the grass, and then you have the potholes in the grass, and then you have the outer layer of the grass where it starts meeting the channel. Um, those fish are usually going to be on at least one of those, in many cases, just one And every day is different. Every day is a different puzzle. So sometimes they will be shallow. Sometimes they will be deep. And if you're only focusing on the deep, you're going to miss all those fish in the shallows and vice versa. And so I think a benefit of artificial lures is it kind of forces you to, to, you know, to try out different areas. You have the ability to, to, to cover more water uh, more quickly. Um, so I, I thought that was pretty cool. And, and uh, yeah, like you said too, the fact about, you know, waiting, it doesn't have to be, um, 
just because you know there's not a boat in the equation or a kayak it's it is literally an, a, a great way to get up close to fish because there's no hole slap super quiet when you when you catch a fish you don't get dragged over the school like you would in a kayak so I, i'm the same way as you or where even I'm, if i'm on the boat i'll hop out and start waiting because that's the ultimate way to to sneak up on big fish yeah no i i and i, I agree and you know the other thing that at least from my perspective is that you're right the artificials you pay, you're like you said you're paying more attention right and you you, you, you know you're, you're having to you know, again, live bait, you throw it out, you sit there, right? Maybe you pop a cork or two or whatever. That may be the extent of, of the additional action you're bringing to it. But, you know, the lure, you got to, you know, you got to decide, am I working it slow? Am I working it fast? Am I hopping it up and down? Or am I, you know, using a steady retrieve? And, again, over the years, you you know, it kind of dawns on you that, hey, I just kind of just dawned on me that the last 10 redfish I caught have all come when I've had kind of a more steady retrieve rather than hopping it up or down, right? Um, or, or the opposite for trout, right? Is that, yeah, I catch an occasional trout when I'm fishing for, for redfish with a steady retrieve. Um, or, you know, if I'm fishing, a, a hopping it up and down for trout, I may catch an, an occasional red, but it kind of dawns on you that, you know, there are preferred ways to, to retrieve a lure, obviously in addition to, you know, the lures themselves. But, but again, waiting for me is you're, you're working the area much more thoroughly. So you not only do you have a lure that allows you to cover more area and work it more thoroughly when you're waiting, and, and again, I'll, I'll say another, and maybe my, you know, what I say the most important tip of any of this in my mind is keep moving. I, I, I'm, I always, I'm amazed when I, when I come out and wade, I, I literally, you know, I work the shoreline just like you would if you were in a boat with a trolling motor, right? I, I, I work it, but I work it slowly and I work it thoroughly. And, you know, if there's a fish to be had in an area, there's a darn good chance I'm going to come across it as thoroughly as I work it, but I keep moving. I, I, you know, I'll sometimes come and wade. I'll start in a spot. I'll see a guy sitting there wading, and he may be using artificials. He might even, you know, seem to know what he's doing. I'll wade, you know, for an hour down, an hour back, and I'll come. The guy will be in the exact same spot, right, using the exact same lure, and I'll say, did you catch anything? Yeah, maybe, I, you know, yeah, I got a couple. And chances are I may have caught 30 or 40 fish. And, and you know, it's not because I'm necessarily a better fisherman, but I, I've covered, you know, 20 times more area. So, yeah. You're, yeah, you're bound to catch more fish if you cover more area. You're which kind using of, statistics. Um, which kind of means you are a better fisherman. <laughs> or at least smarter. Well, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe maybe he has. He's, maybe he's not 20 or 30 years into it like I am. That's all. Uh, it doesn't make me any smarter. But, uh, but anyway, he may, really, he may only be in your five. He may, yeah, he may only be in your five. So, who knows? <laughs> so, what are yeah, – go for it, Luke. I was going to say, it's just really a numbers game when you when you think about it. It's, it's, you know, whoever can put their lure or bait, whether it's live bait or artificial, in front of the most fish is going to catch the most fish. So if somebody's staying in a bad spot or uh, even a slightly good spot, they're not going to catch that many compared to, to you know, what Dave's doing where, you know, moving around and eventually you're going to find the fish. Um, yeah. So that, that's very smart to, to keep on moving. And then when you do find them, obviously stay until it slows down and continue on. All right, Dave. We got. We have like no, we're gonna. Exactly have, right. We're gonna have to have you back because we have like two minutes left. <laughs> and, uh, and and by the way, uh, Dave's blog should be live now on Salt Strong. So we did the a weight fishing kind of a one hundred and one. Uh, and I, I think just after this call, we'll definitely have to have you back and probably do some follow up blogs. But before, since we didn't have time to go into you know the other factors like you know lure retrieval, etc., maybe think of like one or two other like main mistakes that you wish someone had told you or, or maybe the stuff that you see out there most common? Uh, yeah, I, I, number one, keep it simple. You know, as I said, I think that and, and you don't need heavy tackle, right? I, medium light, the medium, you know, action rods, uh, 3,000 to 4,000 size reels, 10-pound braid, uh, and a little bit of 20, you know, maybe 20-pound fluorocarbon leader. A handful of eighth ounce and quarter ounce jigs and, and a bag or two of, you know, your favorite plastic tail is all you need to go out and literally just start catching fish. It, again, just keep moving. Uh, you know, don't fish just straight out. Fish, you know, literally fish, you know, the entire from the shoreline to, to straight out as you keep working down the shoreline. 
Um, and look, look in, look for structure, look for changes from, from, you know, one, uh, from, from, from grass to sand and from, 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 you know, from grass to, to the channel. Uh, again, just basics. Uh, and again, the same principles you use if you're fishing from a boat. Uh, and, and if you work it thoroughly and if you're, and again, really the only other thing I'd say too, is that I find more people work their lures faster than they need to. I, I don't, in, at least in my mind, very rarely can I work a lure too slow. I can only work it too fast. That's good. And so, and especially when I have guys that don't wait a lot and come out for the first time, I'm almost always having to tell them, slow it down, right? Literally just, just quick enough if there's grass to keep it from getting caught up in the grass. And if you're not getting caught up on occasion, you're not fishing it slow enough, right? Um, but work especially it slow. Listen, time. if you keep working it slow, yeah, especially winter time, but... You know, and if you're not getting anything, okay, then, then, you know, then speed it up a little bit, but don't start fast. I, I, I'd rather start slow and then work up to the speed if I'm not catching anything. But uh, I, I find that, as I said, it's almost impossible to work it too slow, um, but I do think you can work it too fast. Um, and, and maybe the only in the same vein, I, I, I'd rather start small and then, and then work big. Um, and I know, you know, listen, we all talk about, in fact, you know, I think, uh, CA just had a great spot this, this past week, you guys published about, you know, starting, especially in the winter time and using small baits. Yeah. But I will tell you that the, the biggest snook, the biggest trout and the biggest redfish I've caught were all caught on a, a, uh, three, I guess three or three and a half inch cal shad, uh, tail. Right. Oh. And, and I fish bigger baits and I do it all the time, but every one of them has been caught and, and regardless of the season, right. Those snook I'm catching are, are from the, from the beach or from the inlets with, with that, that small tail. So, um, yeah, they, they you know, they may like bigger baits in the summertime, but they'll still eat a small bait if it swims right in front of them. Yep. Um, love it. But I don't know. So that's it. I, I guess those would be kind of my, uh, you know, those are the things that I typically see with guys that I take out that haven't fished a lot. It's like, slow it down and then let's start small. Right. Cool. I love it. We're going to have to have you back on, dissect some spots, talk a little bit more about, you know, favorite lures and tackle and retrievals for, you know, different seasons. And, uh, yeah, everyone go check out Dave's blog at saltstrong.com. And please do go check out the Insider Fishing Club. There is an application process. But once again, if you make it in and you spend a whole year in there and you don't feel like it's taking your game up a level, I will personally pay for it. So that is the best promise guarantee you can possibly get out there completely fair and no risk on you. That's at saltstrong.com forward slash podcast. That's it for this episode. Thank you so much, Waiter Dave. Thank you, guys. You the man. Good, good times. See you guys. Tight lines. Yeah, I know. Woo.